Hello guys, welcome back to Back in a Bit. Today on the episode, the final episode of The Boardroom. We have the Halloween special effects makeup. And we take a look back at our time on Back in a Bit. Good morning everyone, I'm Cody Maps and Life. And I am Brody Styles. And thank you for joining us for this very special Halloween episode of Back in a Bit. Now obviously we're a little bit early, but that's not too bad. Special episode as well. 45 minutes, you guys get a lot more of us, don't they? Is, they do. Uh, and I see you missed the memo about costumes this week. Yeah, so I don't know what happened. People yeah. randomly dressed up and... What's happened? Know. I mean, I even I dressed up as Carmelo Anthony. I know you did. I, I missed I, the corners, though, because I couldn't get them in. But oh, we'll, we'll have to settle for D-list Camilla Anthony there for it now. There is. So that's pretty much nowadays. Camilla, <laughs> Camilla Anthony, You didn't have to attack him like that. Well, you know. I've got to. That's all right. Anyway, if you want to join us on any of our social media, you can at Upstart Magazine, and you can also watch past episodes at YouTube.com. Now, we seem to be missing some people. Oh, yeah. Lauren and Jess are missing. Where so, are they? Yeah, where are you guys? We're out here in the fun zone. Jess, I see you've come as 11 today, and I took it upon myself to fix the look up just a little bit by giving you a quick little cut. I'm going to finish my job up here while you read the news. How about that? Fantastic. Thanks, Lauren. In world news, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has sent three letters to the leaders of the European Union after the provisions of the Benn Act were triggered on October 19. The Benn Act passed on September 9 and requires that the British Prime Minister seek an extension to the October 31 Brexit deadline if the House of Commons had not approved either an exit deal or a no-deal Brexit. Johnson sent one unsigned photocopy of the request he was obliged to send, a letter from the UK's ambassador to the EU explaining and a third letter saying that he believes that the extension he requested would damage the interests of the UK and our EU partners. Here in Melbourne, the state government has announced it will provide $46 million in funding to Dockland Studios to build a 3,700 square metre soundstage capable of housing blockbuster Hollywood movie sets. The move is expected to bring jobs to Victoria, with Premier Daniel Andrews saying, this is a coup for our industry and reflects the global reputation of our facilities, locations and talent. And the prestigious Booker Prize for Fiction winner was announced this week, with the panel of jurors deciding to give the prize to joint winners, Margaret Atwood for The Testaments, her sequel to The Handmaid's Tale, and Bernadine Evaristo for her experimental novel, Girl, Woman, Other. In 1992, the prize was awarded to two authors for the first time, Michael Ondaatje for The in English Patient and Barry Unsworth for Sacred Hunger. The 1992 decision proved so controversial that the management team changed the rules so that in future only one book could win. This year's jury chose to defy the rules, saying, we were told quite firmly that the rules state that you can only have one winner. And as we have managed the jury all the way through on the principle of consensus, our consensus was that it was our decision to flout the rules and divide this year's prize to celebrate two winners. So Lauren, what do you think about that, that they've um, given the prize to two winners this year? I think it's excellent, especially two women. Mm. And they've gone against the rules that they usually go for. Yeah. It's excellent. Yeah, and I think it's great that they're um, very kind of female-centric books Absolutely. as well. And, and they're quite sort of um, important to, you know, the time that we're in. Well, The Handmaid's Tale was an awesome series. It's only yeah. just really finished, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think it's still going at the moment. So I haven't haven't kept up to date. With Neither have I. Watch the but it's season. quite controversial... Uh, TV series and it's mm, been... I found it too depressing to watch. <laughs> well, hopefully the book's a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can't see it happening, but I guess we'll, we'll find out. I'm hoping to read both of those books. They look quite good. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to finish up here, but we're going to go to our first story today, which is a makeup artist, Caitlin from Bacchus Marsh, who does special effects makeup for Halloween. I'm Caitlin Skelton and I'm an FX makeup artist. <laughs> So you can do horror looks, you can use prosthetics, which is like things growing out of your face, your back, you can just change the appearance of your face, of your body. It was back in high school, where, um, production, I was on the makeup team and the year 12 makeup artist Shelby, she was like, oh I want to introduce you guys to liquid latex and I was the only one that volunteered to put it on me. And just seeing like my parents' reaction to it, seeing other people reacting to it when I was walking around showing everyone, I was like, 
this is cool, I, I want to do that. So I would come home and I would grab mum's makeup and I would start doing like scowls on my face. And I really liked people's reactions to that. And then it just slowly built up to doing latex on my face, latex on my hands, on my leg. And then it just kind of just all came to me, like all this cool creative things. And now I can create wonderful pieces of art. I've worked on two movies. Mum saw it in the paper and was like, you should ask if they need makeup passes. And I was like, mm, I don't know, I'm too young. I'm only in year 10. Like, they probably got what they need. And then dad came home one day and he was like, I contacted them. You're going in for a meeting with all the other makeup artists. And then being at four o'clock in the morning on the other side of the city, just doing teeth and nails for zombies. It was amazing. I love seeing people's reactions. That's the best thing, like creating something so like, gory or like just something else that people don't think of and then seeing their reaction that's what I like about it. I've always wanted to do the whole of October doing makeup but I've never really challenged myself to do it because I've always started it but never finished it and this year I was like no just do it so I started and I, I, I just like it so much now because now I've got all these ideas coming I'm just going to be doing a simple look, well, simple for me to do. I'm going to be doing like a cut up my mouth with a bit of shading and a little bit of blood and maybe just a bit of winged eyeliner. some stuff now Jess is getting a haircut so we'll give um, some updates on that in the um, later parts of this episode now for the boardroom this week we unfortunately it's the last episode so you know I really went all out I actually dressed up for it at least you got the memo for this one yeah at least it did missing out. yeah so we're talking about weird matches in wrestling let's have a look wrestling is one of the weirdest cultural sensations of millions of fans across the world Wrestling has become a cultural mainstay from the old days of being a part of the circus. But with that comes some of the weirdest things that only wrestling can offer. From storylines involving leprechauns, to weird animal human breeds, to magic, wrestling has had its fair share of weirdness. And in that has come some of the strangest matches that many fans were left wondering who thought that was a good idea. So, I'll tell you the weirdest five matches ever in wrestling that will make you wonder the same thing. I'm Cody Rapson Lowe, and this is The Boy Room. Number 5. The Electrified Steel Cage Match A steel cage match has been a staple of wrestling for decades, with many great matches involving them. So, in 2007, wrestling company TNA added their own twist to it. Yes, TNA was the name of the company. I love the mid-2000s. Anyway, the Electrified Steel Cage Match. Basically, the idea is as the name suggests. You are surrounded by a steel cage that if you touch it, you will be electrocuted. The match featured Team 3D and LAX and was a shocker, mind the pun. Number 4. The Shark Cage Match What's better than an electrified steel cage? An extremely small cage. A shark cage to be exact. 
In 1977, for the rise of the WWE, regional wrestling territories were big in their respective states. The premise of the match was that the two wrestlers were inside the shark cage and had to escape the cage by opening the door. 70s wrestling, you sure were different. Number 3, an object on a pole match. This isn't necessarily just one match, but a bunch of matches. Known for being used heavily by infamous writer Vince Russo, the matches would feature some sort of object on a pole that the wrestler would have to grab to win. Some matches included a contract on a pole, a paddle on a pole, a mistletoe on a pole, and my personal favourite, a Viagra bottle on a pole. Number 2, the Punjabi prison match. This match actually sounded cool when it was introduced in 2006. The Great Khali was an Indian wrestler that was given a unique match he could use called the Punjabi prison match. Leading up to it, it was given a mythos and scared even the strongest of wrestlers, The Undertaker. Then people actually saw what it was and that was immediately taken away. It featured the scariest of structures, not just one, but two cages of bamboo. Yeah, bamboo. But it could still work, right? Well, it would if fans could actually see what was happening in the match. Having two thick cages proved challenging for anyone to see what was actually happening. The Undertaker and the Great Khali could pull it off, right? Oh wait, Great Khali was pulled due to a drug suspension, so he was out of the match and replaced by the Big Show? In the end, it sucked and was not well received. A second match the next year between Batista and Great Khali was a bit more entertaining, but this match seemed long gone. Until 2017, when Jinder Mahal, the first Indian WWE Champion, faced Randy Orton in a Punjabi prison match. So at least it has some longevity. And number one, the ladder match for the custody of Dominic Guerrero. This is one of my favorite terrible matches of all time, featuring two of my favorite wrestlers, Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio. The story goes that the two were in a feud with Rey constantly besting Eddie Guerrero. Eddie then reveals a secret that both of them have been hiding for years, that Rey's son Dominic was actually Eddie's. This resulted in a bunch of segments relating to the custody of Dominic, including bringing in a social worker. But the two wrestlers agreed to one thing that unites them both, a match. More specifically, a ladder match with the custody documents hanging above. Because we all know that the best way to settle any dispute is through a wrestling match, no matter who is right or wrong. Well, that's it for this season of The Boardroom. I would like to thank all those who helped along the way, including everyone from the Back in a Bit team. If you want to watch past episodes, you can at youtube.com slash upstartmagazine. But for now, that's it. I'll see you when I see you. Oh, thank God I can take off this mask. Um, Beck, can you help me? Just get it off. It's good. Brody, can you like also help? Just, just get it off. Just get it. Ah! Uh, so a couple of weeks ago, we spoke about an Australian game, the Untitled Goose Game, and uh, today we've got it in the studio. Yeah, and joining us, Lexi as well. How are you, Lexi? Good, thank you. How are you? Um. I'm, I'm very good. Uh, how, what's your guys' experiences with video games? Uh, I play a bit, actually. So, you know, I um, use it to kill a lot of time, which is probably not a good thing, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, uh, I play it every now and then, just uh, binge it uh, just for a, for a little bit, once a year maybe, and then just that's all I need. Like That's done for me. Uh, so. Well, I, I'm a pretty big gamer, as you can sort of tell from the fact that I'm wearing a Spider-Man suit that's from <laughs> the Spider-Man video game. Um so, one game that's been crazing sort of the whole world, as you were mentioning before, is Untitled Goose Game. It's actually created by an Australian developer called House House, and we actually have it up on the screen right now, and we're going to play a little bit. So, I've, played, I've already played a bit of it. I'm going to show you guys the controls, and then I'm going to let you guys play it, and I'll, t I'll talk over sort of what makes this game so good. So, first off, we are a goose. It wouldn't be called Untitled Goose Game if we weren't gooses, right? And we have to move around and cause as much mischief as we can. Now, when I press this button, as you guys can see here, boom, we have a list of things that we need to accomplish. Okay. So, uh, we need to, I think one of them's put something in the basket, we need to put a lot of things in the yeah. basket, so we need to make... Trap the boy in the phone booth? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, there's a couple of things that we need to do, yeah? Okay. So, can this goose write? Can this goose write? This goose We've can got write. to believe that it has <laughs> some form of writing ability, I hope. Uh, so, the best part you can do is honk. Honk, 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 honk. 
<laughs> we can do that. Right. Um, we can move around like this. And if we want to grab things, so let's see. Ah, oh, yes, we've got the boy here, right? So we should have an airplane here, yeah? And we can grab it and we can run away. <laughs> and now he's going to be like, where's, where's my thing? And if we get caught, he's going to grab it and take it away from us. So, so ideally, you should grab it, grab run it into the phone booth. Trap him in the phone booth. Ooh, that was one of the now, the thing the that I was having problems with before was is that the phone booth, for whatever reason, is closed. So we've got to figure out a way to, to get in there. And also, um, we can, like, put our neck lower. So if we want to grab things that are maybe a bit lower, so let's see, like here, boom, and then we can run away. And if we're here, I believe there is the shopkeeper here. She's going to be annoyed with us, and we're going to have to go out. Because remember, we are, we are a goose. Cool. Okay. Lexi, do you want to have a turn? Uh, yeah, sure. I'll have a, I'll have a crack at have it. Have you a binge for the year? Um, just trying to work out which controllers work. Yep, so the A button right. is the a to is grab, grab it. Yep. B is He's to sprint. It. Oh no, that was pressing B, that's why. It wasn't <laughs> And then he's gonna try and like get at you. Yeah. Can I attack him? Uh, you can kind of. You can honk at them. Some, sometimes if you honk at them, they'll run away. Sometimes if you honk at them, they they will. Try and honk him into the phone booth. Can I like kick the football into the booth or something? Like, <laughs> you can try. The now, the main reason why this game has become pretty popular is because, you know, simple controls, but it's actually kind of a challenging sort of game, you know? You've got to think with your head. It's not just as simple as go to point A or point B. Mm. You've got to think about how to get around this puzzle. It's a, it's a puzzle game, I would say. Yeah, it, it definitely seems like one of those, uh, like, kind of mind bender games. That, yeah. Like, you've got to think outside the box. So, I think she's seen you, so she's going to try and grab a broom and swoop you out. Oh, okay. So we've got we've to be super sneaky and People super selfie. People are really mean to this goose. I mean, <laughs> I don't know, you she's know, doing good, goose The things. life of a goose is a bit What's, goosey. So <laughs> wait, how do I get up my list again? So if you press the negative button, the minus button oh, yeah. up there, yeah, so there's your list to figure Chat out what we need to do. Get on TV. Oh, we're, all, we're already doing that, right? Like, <laughs> Can you cross that off? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, please cross that one off. And go shopping. Um, should we go in here to get on TV? Is that? Yeah, so I believe if you honk with it to the white Y button, hopefully somebody will be able to come out and be like, go away. And then I run in whilst. Mm. Oh. I don't think that's Shop's working. closed. Oh. Well, uh, Brady, do you, would you like to have a crack? All right, I'll have a quick. I'll have a go. <laughs> I'll toss it over to Brody. Now, Thank you. one thing I really like about this game that um, I sort of, you know, when I was playing before, is that the I really like the art. It's not necessarily simplistic. it's simplistic, but it's also oh, hang on. really well done. Oh, oh he's oh, going yeah. in. Oh, okay. Trap him in. Job done. Oh, okay. How did you do that? You got to you got to try and find something that can trap him. Is he trapped? He's trapped. <laughs> We've oh, done it. Hang yeah, on. you can go. The inside. shop's open. Oh. I think I did all of the work for you. To I be think honest. you did. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I just ooh. I'll, I'll take credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> right, now's your time. Go straight in. This is definitely challenging. Yeah, well, not the smartest people I've seen. Friends, but... Yeah, who leaves their doors open when there's yeah. a goose about? Yeah. All right, now, Cody, what yeah, were you saying about me. what makes this game Right, so, so good? I feel like the, the very good part thing about this game is that it's a simplistic art style, but it's also really nice looking, you know. I, I would say that I'm super, super, you know, sort of... Um, so I always like the art in a game. You know, if, if, if the graphics isn't good, then I can't really immerse myself in. So is this considered amazing graphics? Cause it I, wouldn't <laughs> say, I wouldn't say it's amazing graphics in terms of, like, a pure, like... If you've ever seen, like, Japanese RPG games like Final Fantasy, those graphics are amazing. But this is definitely something that keeps you in the game. Um, personally, I always feel like, you know, graphics should keep you in the game, not necessarily take you out of the game. And it can... Like, realistic graphics can work for Call of Duties and stuff, but... You know, I don't know if you want a realistic goose. Yeah, it could be fun. Yeah. See the feathers fly out if Ooh. someone actually does shoe it. Uh, mm. yeah. I know. I feel like it's important for each game to kind of have their own style and yeah. uh, graphic design. You can't have all the games looking the same. Yeah, exactly, mm. exactly. Well, that's about all the time that I have for the game. Did you guys enjoy it? I think yeah, this yeah. is fun. I would definitely be giving it's it a something, go. It's like almost something that's a bit mindless, like so that you can, you know, at the end of the day, you can just do something that uh, really just lets you relax, I think. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it seems like a game that um, is definitely one to just wind down at the end of the day. Mm. Yeah. Well, it is available on Nintendo Switch as we've been playing it on, but it's also available on PC. It doesn't cost too much. I believe it's about 30 bucks. So if you do want it, anybody watching at home, just go to either Steam or the Nintendo Switch store, 30 bucks for the Untitled Goose Game. Well, 
That was a very good game. Now we're going to go over to a very good show. There it is. Am I right, guys? Am, <laughs> am I right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we have been wrapping up the show for, for the day. Um, now, Brody, have you enjoyed your time? I have. It's been very good. Uh, the experience has just been phenomenal. Yeah. Well, we actually chatted with the whole Back in a Bit team to get their thoughts and perspectives on what this show has meant to them and also the subject upstart that we are under. Let's have a look. Uh, I joined Upstart Live because I wanted to improve my skills for video production. So I really wanted to do something hands-on and I'd already written a fair few articles um, and had them published in Upstart so I wanted to try something different and get, a, get some knowledge of all of the technical stuff and actually uh, creating physical content. I really wanted to do something a bit more practical. Just with like previous classes, they weren't super practical in the way that we learned. I've done Upstart before and it was quite a great experience. You got to try new things and meet new people and film so many interesting things. So I, would like, I wanted to do it again. I'm interested towards broadcast side of the journalism. And that's what uh, made me choose um, Upstart Live. I think I've become more comfortable speaking to a lot of people at once and kind of leading um, conversations and sort of gathering everyone up to say something. Whereas in the past, I'd sort of, I'd sort of stay in the corner or just kind of stay out of things. It's not just you working for yourself, it's a team effort and you've got to really make sure that the team effort uh, is there and you're providing for the team effort. I feel like I've become more confident as a host, um, being able to talk more confidently. Just working with different people and um, doing, working to put together something that looks so professional and also is like really fun at the same time, but you get a, a really good idea of what it's like to work in the environment. Upstart Live has sort of enforced that we have to be ready on Monday morning. Like it puts a strict time limit on things and it's really good to just get in and you know what you have to do every week, you complete it, and then there's like, it's very, re very rewarding. I'd say I've got some lifelong friends here now um, and such really good teammates that I could probably hit up after I finish university and be like, oh, would you like to work on something with me? I think sometimes it's not, a, it's not only a show, it's a responsibility of all of us. Uh, I think it's a good place to build up your portfolio and showing um, your work to potential employers. I'd say definitely go for it. It's much different than your normal classes, but if you just dive in um, straight away, you'll find something that you love and you'll just grow to enjoy it so much. Anybody's got any anxiety issues or confidence issues, being a presenter on the show, it can definitely help it, you know, just take the leap. Don't, don't get in your own head about it. Give it a go, yeah, definitely give it a go. Uh, you know, you, it feels a bit weird to start with, but after you kind of get into the rhythm of things and you realise that, you know, you've got a team helping you do it, it's just such great fun, so. I think I would recommend Upstart Live to anybody who is interested in learning a lot in a really short period of time, as long as you're willing to put the work in. Definitely join Upstart. My gosh, it's the best thing that I've done at university. It's so hands-on and I've learned so many cool skills. If you want a good experience to make a show or feel the teamwork, you can join here. Uh, I would say definitely join Upstart. If you're not sure what you want to do, or if you think that you haven't had that much experience with actual media, like the actual media side of university, just get in and do it. Wow, amazing stuff, you know. I think everybody's really enjoyed their time. Actually. Yeah, it definitely looks that way. Yeah, well, somebody who may be enjoying their time as well is Lauren and Jess. Now, guys, can you give us a status update on what's going on? Uh, we're just finishing up out here. Jess, what do you think? Do you like I my think work? It looks great, and it feels really um, light and, like, cool. And Well, it looks fabulous, I reckon. I think you have had the time of your I've life doing this. had the time of my life. Is the, cam is the light in it? Let's do it again. Yep. Vacuum cleaner. Let's get the stuff out of my I think 
we're almost done out here, Jess. Just cleaning up yeah. a little bit. Jess, what do you have, what do you think? Do you love it? I think it looks great. It feels amazing. <laughs> My head feels so light and breezy. I think we did a good job. I think you've had the time of your life. I've had the time of my life. Thank you so much for letting me do this. Oh, I reckon you look pleasure. like 11 now. <laughs> Good. I'm Blood nose and everything. Mm, well, you're looking wonderful as well. Oh, as thank Dorothy. you. I feel like you're the one who committed the most out of the group. Wow. <laughs> I think you've had the most fun. I think I've hair. had the most fun. You've, you've committed the most. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, if you, anyone wants a buzz cut, let me know after the show. I'll give you a good one. Don't worry about it. <laughs> we'll go back to you guys in the studio now. All right. Well, that was looking very good and a lot like Eleven. The, uh, yeah, amazing commitment from Jess. I Absolutely. Mean, probably more commitment than I did. Uh, <laughs> Maybe. I didn't lose I any know. hair for it. I just... <laughs> Lost a lot of my sanity and you know, <laughs> decency and whatnot. That's it. But uh, Lexi, you've prepared a story for us this week with one of Netball's biggest stars. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so uh, this week I spoke to Nat Medhurst, who's probably one of the best netballers Australia's ever produced. And she is very outspoken, but ha has talked about some really serious issues. And in this piece, we talked about probably one of the most serious issues in women's sport. Take a look. This week I spoke to one of Australia's greatest athletes. No, not him. Nat Medhurst. She's a goal attack for the Collingwood Magpies netball team, an Australian Diamonds representative and a dead set legend. This year, three of Nat's teammates announced that they were about to become first-time parents. And it was when I asked this cheeky, light-hearted question that I received a truly important response. Um, so there's a lot of netballers and netballers while I was pregnant at the moment. I know. Is there just not an education program in place or something? <laughs> no, they've got a breeding program in place <laughs> and it's working quite quickly. Um, no, it's, it's, I think it's great and I mean, I think if we're looking at players, particularly being a female sport, like it's something that should be embraced. It's like any workforce. Like imagine being told if you're working, I'm sorry, you shouldn't be having children and if you do, um, well then we won't re-sign you, um, which is sadly the case for girls who are out of contract. Um, it hasn't been nice as well for some of them, and but I think it's great. And at the end of the day, whether they choose to come back or not, um, I think players need more support about around that as well um, and what happens. And being females, that's the reality. There needs to be so much more education, though, around female athletes and fertility because it is a massive, massive issue. So what does the science say about fertility in female athletes? Oligoamenorrhea, also known as infrequently occurring menstrual cycles, can affect 3 to 66% of adult female athletes, with the common causes being reduced energy availability and low body fat, and it can lead to infertility. So with so many athletes at risk, you'd think netball clubs would be talking about it, right? In my whole sort of 16, next year will be my 17th season, I've never had one conversation with the medical staff around my fertility or health as a female. And the reality is that the sport and the rigours that we put out... It, it affects, it, it affects, it affects, you, it affects yeah. your fertility and so many girls have no idea about what we're doing and the impact that it's having or then not having periods or understanding, well, if you want to keep playing sport, you, should you have options? Or should you be freezing your eggs? At what age should you be looking at, you know, if you are on contraception, coming off it or going and speaking to people? And for me, I found out, like, I know that for me to have children, which is something I really want, is that I need help. And I've only found that out recently yeah. um, because it had never, ever been a conversation or something that I'd ever been educated on or broached with. And it, it is, I think, any sport that has a female sporting team they actually need to take this seriously and for players to, end of the day, be able to make an informed decision around what they want for them, if they want to be a mother or not, put it on hold, whatever, but just that they have options and they know what the situation is because, yeah, as I said, um, fertility issues in elite athletes is, is, um, is really, really common. In addition to starting the conversation about athlete fertility, Nat believes more work needs to be done to support athletes once they fall pregnant. We've obviously introduced um, a pregnancy policy, which now looking at what's happened in cricket, I feel like we've got, uh, we need to make improvements on that, particularly being a female only sport. And I think a lot of the girl, former players, um, and as I said, current players like myself, um, we just want to see it shifted yeah. and I think the thing is so when we brought in the pregnancy policy a lot of the clubs 
member organisations, they didn't want this pregnancy policy in place because they thought all the players were going to go and get knocked up so they could then get paid out of their contract. Guys, it's a lot harder than that. It's, um, it's hard to raise a child. So, uh. And you're told when you're like, in, you know, when you're getting your sex ed class that you basically look at a guy and you come, become pregnant. Oh my God, it's so not the case. <laughs> it's so not the case. It's a very tricky process. Um, but yeah, it's... Um, <laughs> It is, as I said, I think if we're, it just needs to be taken a lot more seriously. Yeah. And I could not be more thrilled for AP and Rav. Yeah. It's, um, it's yeah. exciting. Well, thank you so much for that, Lexi. And Lauren, you're joining us back in studio. Yes, How How's I your time am. with Jess? Oh, I had the best time. I'm not going to lie. Thank you, Jess, so much for letting me cut your hair. I enjoyed it immensely. <laughs> does, does that make you an amateur hairdresser? Expert hairdresser, thank you. Oh. Um, it'll be under my little card. I'll hand them out at the end of the show. Hit me up if you need a buzz cut. <laughs> <laughs> you, you only offer one hairstyle. I only get offer the one. I'm not um, trained for the rest, but I'm an expert in buzz cuts. <laughs> now, Lexi? Brody, I hear there's a bit of a, a brewing in terms of power couples and sports. What's going on? Yeah, so this week we've taken a different tack it's, as it's Halloween. Uh, so we've done some digging, some absolutely impeccable research to find <laughs> the top five uh, sporting power couples. So to start us off, we've got Elise, uh, Elise Perry and Matt Tamua. Elise group. being uh, a cricket and soccer international, uh, but now she's just focusing on her cricket. And she's one of the best in the world at that. And uh, Matt Tamua is a rugby player, having just played in the Rugby World Cup. And uh, they did feature in the news this week, uh, all starting off when Matt decided to sledge an English rugby player, by, uh, ben, Yo ben Youngs. And he said, Ben Youngs isn't even the best player in his family and probably not even the country. So... <laughs> So on Friday, yeah. So <laughs> then on back. Friday, uh, Ben returned fire and said, "I find it a bit ironic, seeing as Matt's probably uh, playing second fiddle to his wife, Elise Perry." So, <laughs> 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 yeah, it's yeah. a bit rough. Is that it's rough? a bit true, though. A bit true. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, there's probably not much coming back from that one. Uh, I think. Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, no. Matt might have to swallow his pride there. <laughs> of it. <laughs> but, uh, well, he's um, with a powerful woman. He should that's it. Sorry, yeah. And uh, Elise has had a good start to the WBBL. Yeah, so she scored 81 runs in their opening BBL match for the Sixers. That was against the Sydney Thunder. And she also took two for seven in the bowling. So she was named player of the match. So Elise Perry doing what Elise Perry does. <laughs> what she does best, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then we've got another cricketing power couple. We do. Mitch Stark and Alyssa Healy. So obviously both playing at an international level. Stark, a very good bowler for the men's team. And Healy now making a good start to the WBBL as well. Yeah, so she, yeah, she uh, made an 83-run partnership with Elise Perry before being run out for 42. But uh, Mitch Stark was actually commentating her match <laughs> and they uh, had her on the mic uh, while she was on the ground. And, uh, yeah, she threw a little bit of a sledge at him saying, it's uh, bring your husband to work day. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully he didn't take that too badly. <laughs> it's a very good call, but um, I'm a bit unsure about how I feel about having to commentate your own partner. You'd want to be pretty careful. You yeah, didn't uh, criticise their technique Don't want to get any hot strife at home, I don't or, think. You know, alternatively. You want to show who's the boss? Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. Yeah. And uh, then this is where our two worlds collide. This is probably our favourite couple that we've got. So it's Joe Ingalls, a basketball star, and Renee Ingalls, a netball star. So. Yeah, uh, yeah, so what a couple. Hey? It's uh, probably the most well known couple for Australian sports. But uh, Joe Ingalls has really become a cult hero for Utah fans this season or last season. Uh, there was an article released saying he may look like a mess teacher, but he's critical to the team's success, which <laughs> very I think true. yeah sums him up pretty <laughs> accurately. And uh, as for Renee, it was a very accomplished netball player. Yeah, so she she's actually won a World Cup, um, and she uh, has won a Liz Ellis Diamond Award, so that's the highest honour for a, an Australian player. That's huge. Yeah, and they've also d uh, seemed like pretty good people. They've done a huge amount of autism awareness for their son, Jacob, who was uh, diagnosed uh, when he was really young, so... You know, um, they have definitely used their platform for a good cause. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And uh, Kim Revillian and Adam Chalor with Netball and AFL. Yeah, so uh, Kim R Kim Revalian. I love to I love to correct <laughs> people for that one. Uh, no, so she's actually uh, she likes to make history. So uh, she was the first and only Australian player to play for the country before playing for her state. So That's she awesome. yeah she did that at about age nineteen. So she's she, she knows uh, how to play some good netball and she's won a World <laughs> Cup at Commonwealth Games Silver 
And uh, yeah, Adam Trelaw's not a, not a too bad a football player himself. Yeah, so. he's had a couple of good seasons. He's finished second, second twice and third in their team's best and fairest over the years, and he's also been nominated for All Australian twice. So. Definitely not a bad career for him yeah. so far. And with it, with that in mind, I did see an article recently uh, that they uh, Kim fell pregnant, but the article was star footballer Adam Trelaw and partner Kim oh. Rebellion announced baby. So I think journalists can do a little bit more research <laughs> on that and uh, a bit more balanced reporting would be good to see. So Yes, definitely. Yeah. And uh, finally, Israel and Maria Falau. Yeah, a little bit of controversy with this one, but... Uh, but actually, both great athletes in their own right, despite what uh, the media may say in their personal life. Um, they, uh, yeah, they're absolutely amazing athletes. And uh, But Marie's career at the moment is a little bit up in the air. No one really knows what's happening because she hasn't signed a contract with any New Zealand or Australian teams. So uh, she's playing in the Constellation Cup, which is Australia versus New Zealand. And yeah, before uh, this game, just before the second match in New Zealand, she was seen having tears before the game because it could potentially be her last one on New Zealand soil. So. That's big. That's a lot of pressure. Yeah. New yeah. things opening up for her though, yeah. hopefully. Well, we'll see. We'll see. But then, yeah, moving on from that, I don't, uh, I don't have much remorse because the, the Kiwis beat us by a goal oh. again. <laughs> uh. <laughs> it keeps on happening. <laughs> one goal. <laughs> Uh, that's yeah, that's uh, tough. It, you know, twice in, you know, one cup is a, uh, that's a rough trot. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. yeah, from, uh, we've played four, four of the, three of the last four games have been decided by a single goal, but on Wednesday we beat them by six, so. <laughs> <laughs> but we're coming back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The last game is played on Sunday. Yeah, yeah. in Perth. That's well, that's it. all we have time for to sport today. Thank you both for being our sports presenters, giving us stories every week where we're learning so much. Well, I'm learning so much about <laughs> sport. Yeah, I think I've learned a lot more about netball than I did at the start of the semester. That's, so thank you so much. That is my watching. aim in life, to, to make people aware of this amazing sport. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, our final story today is going to be an outtake look of our great fun time here at Back in a Bit. We've sure yeah, learned a lot this semester on Back in a Bit. We learned about netball in Australia, what gridiron is, and the history of drag. We learned that I love wearing loud clothes, and that Cody has a favourite word. Anyway, 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 anyway. I fell in love with making green screen videos and learned that when you put people in front of a green screen after a long day, things get silly. Quickly. Not to go to spiders. Or Spider Man. The cute you. Okay, sorry. I'm the mom. She's going to let me bite. The cute you. Drier than a dead dingo's dongo? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're looking fine tonight. You got. Oh, what, you got a boyfriend? Oh, okay. We're having too much fun. How's it going? Coming around often? Mm hmm, mm hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's great, it's brilliant. I'm a genius. Sabra! I wouldn't want you to miss this. QQ. Uh, that's going to pop up in 20 years when my career is down the drain. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that was definitely a... <laughs> wow. I didn't realise how, how much you said anyway a lot. Anyway. Uh, anyway. 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 <laughs> Jess, that was an excellent, excellent story to put all together. We we definitely had a lot of fun in front of the green screen. Um, yeah, we. I, it was such a long day that day. And um, I know that I, <laughs> when I've had a long day and I'm really tired, I get really silly. And that was definitely one of those <laughs> that days. That was really silly. Absolutely <laughs> ridiculous, yeah. Um, so what do you... We're oh, just going to... Oh, I think for the final bit... It's been revealed. It's been revealed that Cody is Spider-Man. Who knew? <laughs> uh, I've got to go. Um, I've got to tell Mary Jane. Uh, <laughs> yes, it was, it was me all along. It was along. you all along? It was Cody all along, as if you couldn't tell by me saying my name a couple of times and 
by the fact that I said anyway probably like three or four times already. <laughs> it's your signature. You should okay. probably... I can see with such clear detail now. I I didn't really let on throughout the show, but you can barely see anything in that, if I'm honest. <laughs> like, it was like maybe the eyes up here. <laughs> like, you did look a little bit ridiculous, but you know, it's I for mean, the that's, show. That's, me that's what always, we do. Isn't it? That's how we roll. <laughs> it's what we wanted. Did you guys have a favourite moment from the season? Oh, that was hard. There was definitely, obviously, bugs. Absolutely bugs. bugs. They were uh, delicious. <laughs> they were quite good. Yeah. I'm, I'm, so I have to agree. Cody, you're outnumbered here. They were good. <laughs> they were so tasty. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, did you have a favourite moment? <laughs> favourite moment? Uh, all my favourite moments have been in here. We've always had good laughs. We have had a good time, yeah. With everybody who comes into the studio, everyone behind the studio, always having good laughs. Yeah, I think I really liked making Talk Like a Bogan was pretty fun. Oh, you and Ashley had the best time it looked we like. We really did. We <laughs> laughed a lot. You know, she wasn't very happy that I made her do it, but it was it was good fun. Yeah, We're not here to will. beep spiders. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, I definitely think interviewing, uh, being around Nat Medhurst was just phenomenal to be with someone so big, but just the general experience, you know, we've had a lot of laughs, as you could see. So, uh, yeah, it's just been good all around. Mm. Well, I mean... Are you guys going to miss the show, obviously? I, I, I would hope you guys are going to miss the show. <laughs> I will definitely I'm gonna miss everyone. the show. I'm going to miss everyone. We've got so many people on the show who are about to be graduating who yeah. we just won't be seeing around mm. in uni mm-hmm. either. So, um, yeah. yeah, I'm really excited <laughs> to see what you're going to do when you go off into the Me big too. wide world, <laughs> Me too. We'll, we'll keep you up then. Well, I hope so. <laughs> mm. Well, n- another year. Another year. Done out of the way. Yeah. I mean, pretty much for all of us to see that A, we're graduating, or B, we're going into our final year. So, you know, I can't wait to see some of you around. And I'm so sure. happy for all the people who are going to be graduating. You know, yeah. a lot of people in the back. But, fortunately, that's all we have time for on this episode. <sighs> we would like to give it's a big over. thank you to everyone on our team, especially Bridget, Tim, and Amel. Without you guys, we could not put on a show. Um, we love you guys so much. Thank you so much for all your hard work. We will miss you. Mm. And I think we should give a big shout out to all the backroom staff who, you know, all, all the people in the back. Give us know, a wave, guys. Yeah. <laughs> you can see them. I'm not too sure. But we've got <laughs> Zach, Hi, Astral, uh, Jack. So Jack and Zach and Edison as well. Um, oh, there it is. Hey. 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 Tim as well in the back. Thanks, guys. It's been really great working with you. And you've sort of definitely done a lot of work to make everything run smoothly. And yeah. Mel's put in a lot of um, hard work for us as well, which we really appreciate. Absolutely. Yeah, Mel's the unsung hero of every single upstart show, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever there's a fire, she's got the extinguisher. Hundred well, percent. Um, if you want to watch any other episodes, you can always go back to YouTube, our YouTube channel, Upstart Magazine, so you can see any of the past episodes as well as other episodes from different Upstart subjects, as well as any stories that we've made over the season. Yeah. Well, I think that's it for the last time. I've been Lauren Devine. I've been Cody Masson Lowe, and we won't be back in a bit. <laughs>